the thing with that worst fit customer segmentation that I like to talk to, that's the one that gets my clients like palms sweaty, right? They don't want to talk to this section of their audience. And a lot of it boils down to just kind of shame or embarrassment. They feel like their product didn't meet the mark. Their tool was wrong or bad or whatever the case may be. But that's not the case at all. The case is, is somehow, somewhere along the line, we attracted a poor fit. And I need to know why. What did we do? What was the message we were sending out, the signal we were sending out that told these people that this was going to be the tool for them? And then almost immediately they realized it wasn't. Welcome to episode eight of season nine of Live in the Feast. I'm Jason, AKA Rez, helping you grow your business by having a conversation with someone who's been there, had success, and built a business designed around the life that they want to live. That's Live in the Feast. If this is your first time listening, hit that subscribe button so that you get notified every time a new episode drops. Live in the Feast is in your podcast app of choice. If you've heard the show before, thank you so much for listening. But why not leave a rating and review on iTunes or drop us a comment in Breaker or CastBox? It helps others find the show as well. This season is titled Building a Better and More Profitable Business. It's really all about leveling up to help create a more profitable and sustainable business. Especially in this COVID and soon to be post-COVID time, I think it's so important to be able to learn from one another in any possible way that we can. And today's co-host is Adrienne Barnes. She's an expert in learning from other people. She's a content strategist and audience researcher for B2B SaaS companies. We dive into how we can be better at our own audience, which are our clients, and learn from them and the three segments to identify first. We also talk about if you can't have a third party do the research, and we talk about why that's beneficial, but if you can't do that, then what's the role to play in order to learn the most from your research? And finally, we talk about how to pull out those golden nuggets from all this free form conversation. There is a bonus episode of this conversation available inside a Feast Club where Adrienne shares her list of questions that she asks during these interviews, her rules and constraints, and how to know what to look for and when to go deeper. Check out feastclub.co for more information about that. You can find all about Adrian at her website, Adrian Nicole, that's N A K O H L.com. And she pays homage to her mom on that in this episode. And she's also very active on Twitter. So reach out to her and say hi for me at Adrian Nicole. We could have totally geeked out all about human behavior all day on this show, but let's dive into the show. And be on the lookout for Adrienne's number one question to ask when she really wants to unpack someone's feelings on something. Are you feeling like you're in a silo all by yourself with no one to bounce ideas off of? Are you looking to get predictable revenue into your service-based business? Do you want better clients who respect you? Well, gain the support from like-minded developers, designers, and other creative professionals providing client services inside a Feast Club. Forget those stale articles from 2008 giving you advice on how to run your business. It's 2021. Join Feast Club today and get access to a community, including myself, where we share what we're working on in real time, strategies and resources that work in today's market, and ideas and support for one another in a safe place. You'll get access to a private podcast, which has bonus episodes from some of the guests in this season that you can only get inside a Feast Club. You'll also get access to a monthly one-hour virtual meetup, a private Slack and Circle community, member-only content library, access to message yours truly directly, Also, you're going to get exclusive expert workshops from folks like Kaylee Moore on pricing, Robin Kennedy on email, and Nick Gulig on sales, and so many more. 
There is no better time than right now to learn from those a few steps ahead of you and leverage your skills to help and support others to grow all of our businesses together. So if you want to check it out and join a community that's built on the saying, a rising tide raises all boats, head on over to feastclub.co today. I hope to see you on the inside of the club. Now, let's get back to the show. Hey, Feasters. Welcome to another episode of Live in the Feast. I am super excited to have Adrian here on the show. Welcome, Adrian. Hi. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for having me. We've kind (laughs) of tweeted at each other, had Twitter conversations and stuff like that. So it's always great to put a voice to the, to the avatar, if you will, a little circle, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a good friend of mine that I'd known for years, when you meet in real life, they're like, oh, you have legs. Like, <laughs> you know? So it's always, exactly. it's always a fun thing. So, Especially because uh, my avatar is about four years old. So it's like, oh, you kind of look a little different. I see. Yeah. <laughs> So we're going to talk a lot about audience research here. I mean, I know that you specify in in the SaaS business end of things, but audience research, content strategies, all of the things that you talk about for me on the email side of things is what I talk about, right? like nurturing, simple things about onboarding people after they purchase, especially during trials and first months and things like that to reduce that churn and all that stuff. So we're going to dive into a lot of that stuff. But what I feel, I know from myself and having conversations with other folks, and now I've been in business for a decade and I still struggle with it, is audience research. I know a lot about my audience, both the audience that's listening to this, but also, you know, my services too. But like, I still feel like I could be better, right? Mm -hmm. When you start this process, And which is funny because you start usually figuring out your audience after you've had a couple of jobs. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you go about doing this? Do you just reach out and ask some questions or what's that first step? Yeah. So first of all, like it's funny that you say, you know, you've been doing this for 10 years, but you still kind of feel like you could know it better. That is not uncommon. Like I have so many of my clients. I'm actually working with one right now who's doing great numbers. It's a B2C subscription kind of product. And he's like, but I've never talked to a customer. I've never even sent an email. I don't really know what they're thinking, what's going on. So that's a very common place to be in where we've got people who are running businesses pretty well, but they know that they could do a lot better if they knew their audiences better. So the first step I think is that awareness. Like, okay, we've been trugging along, we're doing okay, but there's blind spots, right? Like we have a feeling like we don't know what their buying triggers are. We don't, why are they buying our product? Or, or what are the results they're seeing once they use us? Or how are they actually using the thing we've created? Sometimes that, especially in the B2B SaaS product world, it's one of the most interesting takeaways is the, the product developers like, but this is, how I made the product to do this, right? It does A, B, C, D done. It fits in this box. And then I get on the phone and talk to people and I'm like, oh man, we've done Z and Y and Q. And it's amazing. If I loop it up with this other thing, it'll actually do P T S D. It's like, it does all kinds of things. And the developers themselves are, we didn't even know that was a possibility. So that first step for me is always, or when the people come to me, when my clients come to me, it's a matter of like, we know we're not doing this well. So help us figure that out. And once they've made that kind of awareness or once they've reached out, that's when we can begin the process. So I always say is the first real like overall look at our audience research is we want to figure out who are we going to reach out to? Who are your customers? I like to, if I'm doing a buyer persona project, it's a little different than if I'm doing a content strategy. But if all we're doing is like we're setting off to learn more about the customers and the users because sometimes in B2B SaaS, those are two different sets of people. We need to figure out who is using it most, who is using it less. Like I like to really divide it into three segments. Your, your best users, your best customers, your like average use case customers. And then those like, oh, they hate us. They turned quickly. They complained. Like our customer service people know them by name because they were commenting everywhere. And so once we've kind of identified those segments, that's when the project can really begin. Yeah. I think what you identified there is like those not so great experiences, right? Because what I do 
for my projects is after the project has happened, I always do, and it sounds very morbid, but it's a post-mortem, right? And so it's really just asking me questions. But Mm -hmm. it sounds like instead of asking me questions, maybe I should, but also ask that of the client. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The thing with that worst fit customer segmentation that I like to talk to. That's the one that gets my clients like palm sweaty, right? They don't want to talk to this section of their audience and a lot of it. And if we're just going to get real, like it boils down to just kind of shame or embarrassment. They feel like their product didn't meet the mark. Their tool was wrong or bad or whatever the case may be, but that's not the case at all. The case is, is somehow somewhere along the line, we attracted a poor fit. And I need to know why, what did we do? What was the message we were sending out, the signal we were sending out that told these people that this was gonna be the tool for them. And then almost immediately they realized it wasn't. There was a mismatch along the process somewhere. And then when I get to talk to that segmentation of customers, that becomes very, very clear. Like, oh, we had said we do A and we use these words to describe this feature when they thought that meant this and we thought it meant something else. So it really does help to clarify much easier and create less friction for our best fit customers, really, the people we want to be attracting more of. Hmm. That for me has always been interesting to try to uncover too, because especially with those not, not a good fit folks is what happened? Is there any way that I can identify those people way up the chain before they become clients? Because then if I can, and oftentimes, you know, maybe there's just some semblance of demographical data. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a personality match. Maybe it's a question that I didn't ask up front in the qualification process. So it's always this constant evolving thing. Okay. So I got a bunch of questions. I'm going to try to set it proper order. You said that your clients get that palm sweaty moment, but you're doing the interviews, not necessarily your clients, correct? Mm -hmm, Yes. So would you say that it's almost best to have a third party hold these client interviews than rather than just the people that were engaged on the project themselves? I would. And I hate to say, of course, it's always best to have a third party because I'm the third party and I want you to hire me. So there's a bias there. But here I have run into problems when I've tried to work along with teams who are talking to these kinds of customers. The issues that they run into is they want to fix the problem. A client will be like, well, this and this and this happened. And that was frustrating. And the person on the other end of the line knows the answer, knows a better solution, knows that this was maybe a poor communication or that there was a bunch of different things that happened that weren't necessarily the tool's fault, right? They're like, no, 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 no. But here's how you could actually fix that situation. And what I come in as a third party, I want to know as little product information as I possibly can, because I don't want to offer up any solutions. I don't want to offer up any other ideas or, or any, anything else that could be concluded as like, oh, let me here try to help you solve this. What I want to do is I'm just observing and hearing and pulling out as much as I absolutely can. So when they're like, yeah, this was really frustrating. And they, you know, sometimes they get emotional or heated about it, especially if it's a new issue and they're in the midst of it. Whereas the third party will be like, oh yeah, yeah, we can, let me, let me tell you how we fix that. Or we approach this this way. I'm just like, wow, that does sound irritating. So can you tell me a little bit more about what got you to that problem? Like, what was the thing you were doing and and how did you have to stop? And what were the solutions you came up with? So where I'm just really trying to learn more information Whereas the person inside the company will usually try to solve the problem. Yeah, I think that that's something that I've learned over the years is to just be empathetic and ears wide open, right? Mm -hmm. Like, look, I'm just going to come into this conversation. I just want to hear what you say. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I guess from the perspective of getting somebody on the call, is it easier to say, hey, you're going to have a call with so-and-so? Like, Adrian versus you could have a call with Jason, who you worked with. Like, is there apprehension on the on the other end to have this interview? Yeah. Um, well, I wouldn't. I don't have the data for like the in house kind of conversations, but I know when we've used third party, I had like an eighty five percent response rate for my emails that get booked 
to calls for interviews. And so that's kind of what I've been preaching lately is people are like, Oh, I don't want to bother my customers. I don't want, they don't want to get on the phone. No, but who wants to get on the phone? Like I keep hearing these objections and I tweeted it actually the other day. It's a self-limiting belief for you to think your customers don't want to talk to you because every time I send out an email and I'm just really transparent in the email. So I'll give you an example email that I use this across the board, B2C subscription, B2B SaaS. I just say, hey, this is what we're doing. We're trying to make our product better. We're trying to learn more about our customers. Can we get on the phone with you for 30 minutes? Here's a link. So it's clear. They know what I'm trying to do. I'm not sales, you know, marketing like, hey, da, 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 blah, like splashy. It's just very simple. And people sign up my calendar will fill up. I'll have like 35 spots for a project and it is filled up within 24 hours, which seems like a really like crazy thing, but people want to share their experiences. And that's what I ask for. Like, all I want to know, I'm not selling to you. All I want to know is what your experience was with this product. And they get on the phone and they, they don't mind sharing and they like to talk. And I get to learn all of these good juicy bits of information. So when I'm coming in as a third party, I think they are more open and more willing to share maybe because I'm not, they know for darn sure I'm not selling anything because I don't have anything to sell to them. I'm not going to try to fix anything or solve their problem. It's really just like, I want to know more as much as I can about you. And I want to hear your experience and people like to talk about it. Yeah. It sounds funny, but that's why I say all the time, like, especially if you're working in a certain niche or technical space, or you work with certain products or something like that, monitor social. People mm-hmm. love to complain about things. Yes. <laughs> right? They get very emotional about things, especially if they were trying to do something and get frustrated with it. They got to spout it from the hilltops on social. You could jump in the conversation right there. Absolutely. There's a couple of things that I want to kind of ask you about, like the specifics, like what questions to ask, but also what questions to stay away from and some other things too. But before I dive in a little bit, I always like to ask this and what has been your defining moment in life so far? Oh my gosh. My defining moment in life, Jason, that's like you're, we're going all kinds of places. Um, (laughs) Well, okay. Yeah, I can, I can answer that. So my defining moment in life would be the moment we decided to homeschool my kids. My daughter was four. We were going to, we were looking at preschools. We were going to put them into school. And I realized as a mother and a parent, what I love most about parenting is not like cooking food or doing discipline or like bedtimes or baths or anything really. I'm not, I don't play. I'm not a play mom, like they say, but I loved watching my kids learn something new. So we were considering preschools and I was like, why would I send my kid off to a school when that's the really the only part that I super, super love about this whole gig is to watch them learn. And then, so we did, we decided to homeschool and then homeschooling my kid, my three kids that now translates into how I run my business, how I run my consultancy. It really has to find the fact that I'm not ever going to go walk into an in-house. Well, I don't want to say ever, but the plan right now is not to go into a job. You know, I want to do this thing on my own. I want to define my own terms. And we kind of all work together and we're a team and they're downstairs right now. And we're just trying to like figure this whole thing out. But yeah, that would probably be a life's defining moment. Yeah, I I think it totally makes sense. And the reason why I love asking that question is because I think I can't recall anybody that I've ever asked this question that it actually does not loop back into what we're having the conversation on the podcast about, right? Because people always talk about that life work balance. Mm -hmm. I've always said, look, there's no such thing. It's integrated, it's meshed, it's whatever, right? Same thing for me. Like one of the things, the reason why I started my business was so that I could be home, Mm -hmm. uh, watch those first steps, hear those first words and things of that nature. And so when you said the best thing that you, the the thing that you enjoy the most is watching them learn something new. I was like, that's why you do the calls, right? Like you go in there with no bias or awareness of how to use something and you just listen to what the person is saying and you learn what they and how they've kind of peeled back the onion so to speak so it makes total sense wow jason Uh, what a connection that's true i never even made that myself but yes (laughs) (laughs) so some of the things that i think and i saw this on your website I've, i've seen you tweet about it too is 
this concept of jobs to be done, right? Now, I've read some articles on it. Uh, I have a friend in a mastermind group that, you know, she talks about these sort of frameworks and things of that nature. And she is in the the, the UX mm-hmm. research space. And so jobs to be done for me, can you describe at least at a, at a high level what that is, but also, and I've never correlated why it's called jobs to be done. Yeah. Well, okay. So it began... Harvard Business Review and Clayton Christensen, I think in the 90s, was kind of the founding father of this jobs to be done. There's another two people almost at the same time came up with the term jobs to be done. I like to use Clayton Christensen. So if anybody out there is a jobs to be done expert and they're like, but wait, she didn't say anything about this. That's because I forget that other guy because I've really focused on Clayton Christensen. So if we have any job student experts, that's where all my referencing is coming from, just to kind of make that clear. Really wanted to find out, and his original research was on like these milkshakes. This was a company, he was coming in. They were like, we don't know why people are buying milkshakes, but we think it's a good product. What's going on? So he goes into the uh, fast food restaurant in the morning and he sees people buying these milkshakes. For one day, he just kind of sits back and observes, right? Then the next day, he starts asking the people as they walk out to their cars, like, hey, why why did you buy a milkshake? And after having conversations with these customers, he realized like, oh, they're hiring milkshakes to like serve as a breakfast, almost like a, an interbetween snack while they're on the go to work. So it was very interesting. It wasn't like, oh, because we like desserts or because ice cream is my favorite food. It was, we need something that kind of keeps me full, that keeps me entertained on the, in the traffic on the way to work and that I is mobile essentially. So his whole approach, the way he looked at it was people hire products and services to do a particular job for them. So what job have you hired? Like you've hired your microphone to do a particular job. You've hired the monitor you use for a particular job. And most of that is probably because you're a podcaster. So you're using these things quite frequently. And so as someone who's coming in and trying to help companies figure out what is it, how are people using their product or service? What are they hiring your product or service to do? And it's used in product, it's used in UX, it's used in marketing. I've kind of and tweaked it a bit and people, jobs we done purists might be like rolling over and frustrated with my usage of it, but I've really integrated it with buyer personas and said, you know, we, we do need some buyer persona demographics, sociographic information, but we also really need that like customer journey and what is the job they're hiring this thing to do. So I've blended it all together and create what I call the best buyer persona. And I, and I never, maybe I went with that other guy. <laughs> like, I never understood that like, okay, but it, it's not a job that I'm hiring for. But now how you, you describe it, that makes total sense to me. I guess one of the things that the jobs to be done, methodology, audience research, these interviews, all of that stuff, it's super valuable. I get it. I totally understand why this is needed, especially if you want to grow and really take your business to that next level. But what would you say to the person that says, Look, this takes forever? It doesn't actually. I think that is a common misconception. When I talk about, we need to talk to our customers, we're going to do this stuff. People, if you're not in it, think, oh my gosh, that's probably going to be a tech stack this high of tools, it's going to cost me thousands of dollars a month, plus like hundreds of customer interviews, plus time and plus and plus and plus. And really, it's not that complicated. I even preach you could do audience research in an hour a week. If you kept up the momentum and just talk to one customer every single week, and then kind of transcribed your notes and took a few of the highlighted things from that conversation, by the end of a quarter, you would have a really good idea of exactly who your entire audience is. Now that may take a long time, but it's not a huge time investment up front, right? Like it's only an hour a week. You schedule one call, you you have your interview, you at that moment, block off your hour. I would suggest 30 minutes for an interview. And then you spend 30 minutes transcribing, pulling out the data and like plopping it in Excel spreadsheet. And then you're done. When I do a full like buyer persona project, so we're talking like I'm getting on the phone with 20 to 30 customers doing these interviews, 
creating surveys, creating all of the email copy, and then actually putting and parsing all of the data up, that project itself is usually six weeks. So it's not terribly time invasive. And the most time consuming part is the, the interviews, the conversations. And that's basically just trying to make sure I can meet your customers' schedules. So we offer times at various points of day, even on the weekends, because we really want to make it convenient for people to get on the phone. But it's not expensive and it's not as time consuming as I think people fear it may be. Yeah. I mean, I guess you would say it's best to keep it as an ongoing thing, right? Like it's not a one-time hit and run kind of thing, right? Yes, absolutely. At Best Buyer Persona. So we have the one project, which is a large buyer persona, but I hate it when I can hand it off. And then it's like, but please don't stop talking to your customers. Like, please keep these conversations up. So we actually developed uh, an offering where it's just customer development, where I talk to, I do that one hour a week for you, essentially. And then I, I give you like a highlight in an email. These are the top three highlights we got from your customers this week. Boom, 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 boom. So it's very actionable for teams and it's, they don't even have to really worry about it, but they know that they're staying in touch with their customers and their customer base. I want buyer personas to be a living document. I'm tired. Like it, it saddens me to see them as like a marketing checklist project. It's like the CEO says, Hey, we need a buyer persona. And then the CMO goes, Oh, okay, great. And then like they throw something together on an afternoon and like, okay, check now it's done. And it's filled with like ridiculous information that nobody cares about. Like who cares what superhero your customer thinks they would be? I don't know who cares that information, but it's the, they're in there. I've seen hundreds of buyer personas at this point and the amount of useless crap that gets put into a buyer persona, it would surprise you. Maybe <laughs> it may not surprise you. <laughs> so I guess then, and you, you mentioned a couple of times, like to pull out those good pieces of information. Since everything's so freeform, how do you know what to pull out? Yeah, that's a great question. That is a great question. So what my process for like what we call coding the data, essentially, if you do social services work, that's where I kind of gathered this concept is when social sciences come in and they observe and they do interviews, they end up having to code the data. I've done it in kind of a smaller scale where I get in my Excel spreadsheet. And when I'm asking questions in my interviews, I'm already thinking of the bucket it's going to go in on my spreadsheet. So if I ask you like, well, can you tell me what you love about this product? And they'll be like, oh yeah, well, this part is great. And that was amazing. And da, da, da. so I'm listening to those words. And then when we have the transcription, it's cut and paste. So I'm using a lot of like the emotional kind of words that they'll get into like, this was frustrating or this kind of annoyed me or I don't understand when da, 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 da. And those become like the emotional buckets that I put it in, in the Excel spreadsheet. That, that's kind of what helps to form the patterns that I begin to see. So if I have like a, a frustrating bucket, motivations, buying triggers, that kind of thing, those buckets in the Excel spreadsheet, it's a puzzle. So then once you lay it all out in that way, and each comment is kind of segmented into its own personal bucket, you can see, oh, here's a common thread. People were frustrated with the onboarding process. So we need to address that. And often in my buyer personas, there are recommendations for improvement. Like a lot of people talked about this, or there's also, we want to know who they are. So it's like most of your people are mid-level managers or most of your people are software developers. It's really a simple cut and paste. So the process of it isn't difficult, but it does take overview of like reading the data, going through it, and then allowing those patterns to start emerging. Yeah, that's awesome. And I heard a lot about that emotion in there because, you know, from my perspective on the email marketing and automation side, I always say, look, we can find the intent pretty easily. Like the lead magnet, whatever they came in, we could kind of figure out what their immediate problem is that they're trying to solve. But if you want to get them to that next level, whether that's buying something from you, signing up to something, all of that stuff, you got to tap into the emotional side, which is the harder of the two to figure out. How do you in this, and, and mind you, I minored in psychology and I love human behavior. So this is certainly a personal question of mine, but how do you tap into that emotion without kind of coming off as like, I, I really want to know, you know, yeah. like, like <laughs> how, how do you tap in to get those really good pieces of emotional data? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a simple 
question that is my favorite, my favorite one. And I save it for those emotional, when I hear those emotional words um, and it's basically, oh, wow, that's really interesting. You mentioned this was frustrating. Can you tell me more about that? And this goes back to that. And I'm going to quote a thing that I don't know the source of it, but it's that five why, right? If you can ask somebody why five times, you'll get to the actual core of it. So you can't on an interview, just sit there and be like, oh, really? Why? But why? Right. And they'll start to think you're coming and attacking them. Um, so I have to rephrase my whys into more like curious, interrogative, basically trying to, to question what else is going on. Like, oh, so when you said this, could you tell me what that means? And you mentioned that that was an annoying thing. What do you mean when you say annoying? Like, tell me what that process is like. So really trying to um, dive a little bit deeper, not just letting them say an emotional key term and then letting it pass, actually asking a follow-up question that helps to generate more insights into like the buying trigger that gets those deeper level pain points that then become like what I call those gold nuggets. Those are just gold nuggets. The five whys is something that once I heard about it, it made total sense. And like, you know, like you said, you could be like that, at like my four-year-old son, right? Why is that? Today he asked why the snow is white. Like, dude, ah, kid, I don't know. Can we put on your boots and go to school? Like, <laughs> like, I you don't know. know. Yeah. Right? So, but the thing is, it's like, you do, you kind of have to. And one of the books that I'm actually reading right now, Never Split the Difference mm -hmm. by Chris Voss, right? And what he talks about in there is like mirroring. And it kind of sounds a little bit what you're saying there is like, oh, so it seems like mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? And so you're kind of making that connection, which opens up that trust factor. Like, oh, they understand who I, who I am and they're listening to what I'm saying. And so it kind of taps into that human <laughs> behavior psychology type thing that I don't know. I geek out on sometimes. Me too. I do geek out. That's what, I mean, that other newsletter that I have, human behavior means marketing. I like, I love to learn what it is that makes people tick. So I do that a lot. Like, oh, I'll, I'll repeat their exact phrases back to them. And it's as if, man, she really gets it. She understands like, this is hard and I may or may not get it. Sometimes I do. I mean, we're all people who struggle with tools. Like I'm just asking how you struggle with the tool. It's not like it's some really intimate detail about your life, but it helps them to then like share and elaborate, which helps me identify and target them better in marketing campaigns. How did, how did you get into human psychology and human behavior there? Uh, I'm nosy. I'm really nosy. <laughs> I, I really am. I, and I've always, I was that kid growing up when they were like, Oh my gosh, could you stop asking questions? Like you like your kid, why is this snow white? I just asked questions all the time and kind of unashamedly, like, I want to know why, what is it that you learned? What do you have going on? I don't know. And I was in journalism. And so just what makes people tick and, and think and I just, I love people and I'm nosy about them. So that kind of, that sent me right to human behavior. Yeah. I always, I always ask, like my brain's always going and my wife is like, she just accepts it now. I'll just come out like so random question, you know, like yes. one of the things that always sticks in my mind is one time we were just driving and I don't even know where we were going, but I asked her, I said, Hey, you think when bakers go home, they have like new bread smell? Right. And she was like, what? what? Where are you? I said, and I was just like, well, in my head, I was thinking about like new car smell and then like, like all of that stuff. And then I said, you know what? Here's a better question. You think that the factory workers that actually put the cars together, do they go home as new car smell? <laughs> right. Like, right. I don't know. It's just how yeah. my brain works sometimes, you know? Absolutely. I had that same conversation with my husband recently, actually, because it's becoming more apparent to me that everything I do, I also just tweeted this, which... I spend a lot of time on Twitter, apparently, because I keep referencing all my tweets. But the, my whole everything I do is asking questions and then providing other people's answers. So this part of asking questions and just being really curious is very natural. Yeah. I asked my husband the other day, I was like, do you think I ask a lot of questions? And he was like, are you kidding me? Like, this is what we spend all our relationship doing is you asking and me just kind of either not knowing or answering. Yeah. Yeah. And that's my wife is like, well, that's where TJ gets it from. All those questions that are coming from him come from your brain. Yes. So. <laughs> it's your DNA, buddy. So exactly. accept it. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, I know, I know. I'm sorry. You know? <laughs> so 
Before I let you go, what's up next for the next six, 12 months? Oh, I am growing. That is what is up next. I am focused on my goal. So it became very clear to me um, at the very end of 2020 where I wanted to go, where I wanted to take this. I wanted to focus in on my best buyer personas and really giving this to people and making it a good product I service. And then just being the best at like audience research, customer insights, I want to, when people think, who do I know and B2B SaaS that could do some audience research, like I, Adrian needs to be the name. So that's what I'm working on. That's my next step is to really grow either, you know, it's still kind of at that spot where I'm trying to decide, is it a consultancy? Is it an agency? I think the needs of my clients and the product itself will kind of drive that to one way or the other. It's looking like it will probably go agency, but you could ask me in three months and it might be different, but yeah, growth is where we're headed. That's what I'm looking for. Awesome. Yeah. I can't wait to see as, as I'm sure it'll go out on Twitter. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. Well, Eugene, thank you for uh, spending some time with us today and, and sharing some wisdom and your experience. Where can folks reach out and say thanks? Yeah, obviously on Twitter, I'm at Adrian Nicole, N-A-K-O-H-L, which is odd, but thanks mom. And that's actually how you spell my middle name. And, um, then, you know, really, if anybody, even in your audience has questions, like I'm in the middle of a project and I'd like to get started, feel free to email me. I'm at a and B at adrianicole.com. And I am happy to just kind of shoot ball some brainstorming ideas or whatever needs to be done or send me a DM on Twitter. But yeah. Those that's really where you can find me. Awesome. Well, we'll certainly link up all of that information as well as your newsletter in the show notes. Definitely go grab a hold of that, especially if you're in the human behavior space like us do. <laughs> and even if you're not, it's super. Just pick up on things and then you're like, oh, yeah, that, you, you'll start to see patterns. Trust exactly. Me. Trust me. Yes. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Adrian, uh, for coming on the show. Super to have you here. Great to meet you as well. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate it. It was fun. Everyone listening? Until next time, it's your time to live in the peace.